Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we dive deep into Arbo's most bibliophilic work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Possession 15.4. But before we do that, Elliot, I am possessed by the idea that I should tell you about the newest podcast on the Doof Media Network. Oh, which... that's not a good way to start this plug. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's fine, it's fine. Um, if you like words and things that sound a lot better than that segue, you'll love Kingslingers, which is a new <laughs> podcast uh, discussing the Stephen King Dark Tower series of books, and you should check it out. The first episode, I think, is going to go live, what, today? In a few days? Uh, yeah, there's an intro episode out that kind of gives you the 411, and then I think it's on Thursday, so uh, three days after this episode comes out, uh, the first proper episode of, of Kingslingers is coming out. Yeah. Um, it's always exciting to have a new show on the network. And so we thought we'd talk about it here. And also this was a show that only exists because, uh, we've hit a certain number of patrons. It was one of our goals for getting more patrons on Patreon and we hit it. And so now this show exists and it's, uh, it's just a great way to demonstrate that, you know, the network's growing and we're doing all kinds of cool stuff. So Yep, and it's all thanks to the patrons. Yep, um, so go and check it out. Hey, why not? Go subscribe. Do it. Yeah, uh, like, you know, it's from Matt and Scott. I'm sure if you're listening to this, you probably listened to We've Got Wards, so you know what they're about. Um, mm-hmm. it, it should be really fun. They're, they're flipping the script as well, which is part of the reason I'm so excited for it. I can't wait to see Matt take the role of uh, the novice <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and Scott take the uh, the guider. Yes, that does sound fun. Um, yeah, so go go check it out. Yeah. Um, should we talk about this, uh, this story though, Elliot? Yeah, I I suppose that's what we're here for. All right. Um, so it feels like it's been a long time (laughs) because (laughs) I've been on holidays for a little bit, but it's actually normal schedule to you listeners, but I'm just going to (laughs) remind myself of what has just happened. So 15.3 ends with Blake, uh, being offered, you know, guardianship of the exit of the library. Um, and he's just kind of (laughs) mulling this over. And that's how this chapter starts is, is Blake thinking about this deal, thinking about how much he would just love to sacrifice himself for his friends. Um, and so he's of course going to take this deal immediately <laughs> i mean yeah you'd think but um but no not quite because this is also fighting against his other love of not being trapped mm. um as you just said it's been a while since we recorded an episode but i'm pretty sure i ended 15.3 on like a five minute rant about everything i loved about how this decision was challenging blake yeah um so i won't do that again but it, it's awesome and it's it's challenging him in so many ways like and it carries this whole chapter and it's great yeah, um, I I want to pull out this quote that I really liked from the start, where Blake runs his hand over the wooden throne and thinks, anyone else might find it uncomfortable, but I was largely made of wood. Minor discomforts didn't tend to come up anymore. Um, and this is unsettling, obviously, but something I really like about it is he's not saying that it, he's not uncomfortable. Like, it would still be uncomfortable for him. He just kind of doesn't have that anymore like he's kind of tuned (laughs) that out so it's not that it's not uncomfortable for him it's just that he's so far gone that that doesn't really impact him anymore and i think that's a good little microcosm for this chapter which is kind of all about how much this seems like it would be a good fit for blake on the surface but only because it's kind of reinforcing all the worst habits that he's kind of made yeah like obviously as the chapter evolves the more we learn about this deal the, the less good it sounds like um yes I found myself questioning how bad was that inkling's life from a few <laughs> chapters ago that it wanted this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think like the important thing here is it does kind of feel though at the start, even, even with this chair to the side, the abyss is actually trying to lure him into this, right? Like it's, yes. it's presenting him with some of his old stuff. It's like, you know, there's this chair. It's kind of at this point still going for, hey, you know, you could do all worse than this, which yeah. is which is also the opinion that a bunch of the others take. Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels like it's a. I mean, it feels like a trap, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not. It's not so bad. Like the bit, like things like the chair, like the uncomfy chair. If it had been this fucking super luscious, comfortable throne of of leaves, Blake would have been like, "Well, this yes. is a fucking lie." Yeah. Um. It, it it's presented as an offer that is shit, but like if you look at Blake's other life plans. 
you know, maybe not the worst. Um, yeah. At least that, that's definitely how it appears to the others, at least. Yeah, um, but I think we start to see how uh, actually shitty it is over the course of the chapter. We'll get to that. I, I kind of want to call out one other thing to keep an eye on, which is just the kind of the energy of this chapter, right? Because it, it takes this format of not quite coming to an argument, but definitely some of the people here thinking... Like, you should just take this. Like, you're the oh, one yeah. who's been sacrificing yourself, even going so far as for some of them, Jeremy, to say that you're, you know, just an other, nothing important. So this is a, an okay deal. And I, I think, obviously, that's bad that he goes a bit too far there. But it's an interesting thought, like, thinking about, in this situation, what would I do if I was one of the non-Blake people? Like, how would I see this? How would I see this choice that Blake has to make? I think it's something interesting to keep an eye on how tense this chapter gets and whether we think that the other people are acting unreasonably or not. It's kind of a, a no-win situation, right? Yeah, I found it very impossible to blame anyone uh, for how they feel. I think that one point where Jeremy just kind of mentions to blake that he's not really a human anyway it was the one point yeah. where i was like oh that's kind of a dick move yeah but it's still not wrong um like the core premise here for everyone else is hey the guy who's already a, a scrap of a human being remaining has to sacrifice himself for the whole rest of the group to go kind of scot-free from here like it's it, it's hard to blame them for thinking that that's a deal that they just need to take yeah um of yeah. course you know obviously that doesn't apply to like our core core group which now includes rose i'm i'm happy to say i can now like include rose in um like you know team blake uh <laughs> she does pretty good this chapter right this is a very yeah. uh, good rose chapter i don't know if we'll have well, a chance to talk about this later but i think it's interesting to think would blake take this deal or even just be more willing to take this deal if alexis was still alive yeah i, I mean that's something that's that's definitely something that like came into my mind when alexis's ghost wh whatever the fuck it was yeah. comes up later on um yeah like i i feel like he would i feel like he would have in a heartbeat to be honest if 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 alexis is one of the people to who this saves i think there would have been even less hesitation yeah on his end to take it to save her especially given what ty and tiff bring up later um but like i guess we're jumping ahead um so something else i wanted to bring up from the start of the chapter is how like we, i already sort of touched on how i love how this is challenging like everything to do with blake and his character but i also love how the way that this argument plays out it also starts to test everyone around blake in this mm. cool group like obviously we start to push against evan and his inability to let things go um rose comes out of the blue and and you know challenges her own character pretty coolly and uh obviously then we have like green eyes who uh comes in and I, like i don't know i found it really hard to get a read on exactly what green eyes is thinking here other than obviously she's very anti blake yes. being stuck down here yeah like i think i think she's just sort of she's hoping for that for that you know that future with him sitting there watching tv or whatever like her, hers or something like that just chilling with her friends basically yeah, yeah, it's an interesting chapter. This really forces people to confront some of the themes that we've been thinking about this whole time, right, of, of yeah. the otherness of others and all of this stuff. Um, so to start with, it seems like almost everybody is on the side of, well, it's shit, but yeah, Blake, you got to do it, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Except for Evan, who immediately jumps in and um, starts defending Blake, talking about how, you know, this is a, a decision <laughs> they shouldn't even consider. Yeah um i mean it's exactly where you would expect evan to stand on this uh it, it's pretty beautiful what he says um like i i was i was loving it as he tried to give his speech in defense of blake uh i was also quite impressed like wobbo did a really good job at creating a speech where i understood why a lot of the others in the group didn't quite grok what evan was saying because he's a seven-year-old and he's not yeah. the most um good at explaining himself like i am just now um <laughs> masterful but, yeah <laughs> um but obviously like i think as readers knowing blake and evan as we do you just immediately get what he's saying like this is like evan's the only one i think who understands how much this is going to hurt blake to be trapped like this and he he, he expresses it in a way that gets through to the audience so well but doesn't <clears> quite <throat> get through to the the rest of the characters and I, I really like that that line is sort of walked so well yeah, I, I think the the core of his argument that I really like is, he says, so let's treat this like we would treat any other trap and take a hike, <laughs> which is so 
on point. Like, every other trap that they've dealt with, Blake has been there and he's been like, no, we're not going to let you fall into this. We're going to do our best to pull you out of it. It's not acceptable to, to risk it. But when that trap involves Blake, everyone else, and honestly, Blake as well, are much more willing to just walk headlong into it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of a lot of that sense this this chapter like Blake at the start here it isn't really looking for this third way out for himself like he sort of so instinctively does for everyone else yeah and, and like thinking on that led me to realize how much the library has been leading up to this and kind of training him for this decision like obviously when we lost Millie in 15.1 that was mm. the abyss kind of punishing him for taking the third option yeah um Something that uh, I forget exactly who brings up later in the chapter is that, like, Blake and Rose have already made this sacrifice for Kathy. Mm. Like, Kathy was kind of immobilized by the library, and they sort of just had to say, well, uh, you should get out of here, but we're going to have to leave you. And and they chose to. And, you know, she was less damaged than Blake at the time. Well, yeah, it's kind of hard to say for sure, because she physically. seemed... <laughs> yes, physically less damaged, but also, like, <laughs> mentally seemed more far gone <laughs> i don't know yeah but but like you know all all of that stuff has been kind of the library training blake to to be in a position where this decision is really the only thing he can do is say yes yeah yeah um yeah it's pretty good uh so th- uh, one other thing about this that i quite liked is blake really approaches this kind of from a very vulnerable and open position like he's not even though he doesn't want to take it, he's not deceiving any of the others about this kind of deal. He's not He's not trying to... He almost seems like he's trying to convince them that he should take it and then have mm. them convince him. Like, anytime someone's like, oh, well, maybe this won't count as this, or maybe it won't be quite as convenient as we think, Blake's there arguing against him, being like, no, actually, it will solve this problem, it won't solve this problem. Like, it's very clearly a pretty good solution, and that's why I need to take it. Without saying that last sentence... Yeah, well, I think what's really fun for, like, the the first, like, two-thirds of this whole chapter and conversation is Blake is effectively mute for most of it. He talks Mm. a couple of times to basically say, yeah, you know, you're right, or, like, all sorts of very defeatist things in there, like, he probably should take this. But any time people are making arguments sort of for him, he's kind of completely mute, and he thinks on, like, the noise in his head. Like, you can just... As this as this beat kind of hits us a couple of times, you start to get hit with this sense of a- any time Blake starts to be thinking more on the lines of he shouldn't take this deal, the abyss is just kind of blatantly interfering mm. and just like filling his head with noise so that he can't think. Um, it's yeah, so like not only is that like cool because it kind of you know is is our first sign of the of the abyss kind of. I think the abyss's insecurity about how this is going to go, um, <laughs> but it's also great because it means with Blake out of the picture, we get all the other characters really having this argument, and I think that that's a really fun way to frame it. Like with Blake chiming in to kind of clarify things, it's really interesting to see all the people around him make this case for why he should live or not, mostly for the the people close to him. It's um, yeah. like it's a, it's such a cool way of doing it. Yeah, definitely. I, I like that it. This whole chapter kind of sets up Blake having to make this decision, but really it's everyone else. From the very start, it seems that Blake is going to say no, and it's just everyone else trying to wrap their head around that and come to terms with that for most of the chapter. Yeah, like if nobody else had been here to talk to him, I th- I could see a situation where Blake talks himself into taking this. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I can see that too, I guess. Um, there's there's a line later on where he talks about how weighed down with guilt that he doesn't want to accept the the offer he is. Um, so I can definitely see him uh, kind of eventually just folding into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I think I, I think just left to him, his own devices, he would have been able to focus on the people he's lost and hurt and and wanting to let the others go, and he probably just would have pulled the trigger. Yeah. Um. So. <sighs> More allies come to defend Blake. Uh, Green Eyes kind of finds her way into this scene, and she <laughs> immediately starts backing up Evan about how bad of a deal this is. And the thing that she brings is asking them, if this is a give and take, what are you giving Blake in exchange for him sacrificing himself? And there's no <laughs> good answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, just a little aside, but the first thing Green Eyes really does when she when she uh, comes on here is, is start to tell us a bit more about what, what shape 
this is going to take. Like yes. she's able to communicate that to the others better than Blake is. And uh, <laughs> something that just sort of occurred to me rereading this was like Blake has spent this entire story kind of refusing to die when everyone and everything was saying he should just die. <laughs> yeah. And then a few chapters ago, he finally decided, okay, you know what? This is it. I'm done. I'm ready to die. Like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna see this to Rose. She can she can have it. And and now the universe is sort of you know being like, well, too late. Like it's eternal torture for you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, no death. Like it's just poor Blake. Um. It. I, I think when I when I was thinking about this, like I quoted uh Miss Lewis when she visited him in the drains uh, during my live read, like that bit where he he finally accepts the lawyer's offers, offer in the drains and Miss Lewis is just like, no, it's too late. Like uh, it's just yeah. every time every time Blake gives up something mentally it's it just gets taken away he has the hardest time yeah he needs to stop taking so many stands <laughs> you know, he, but also at the same time he needs to take more i'm very <laughs> confused on this <laughs> yeah um he keeps he keeps ending up in these no win situations is the problem <laughs> yeah uh but it's good to have green eyes back green eyes and fn are a very powerful um debating team and they do a lot of hard work here too uh, defend Blake, and I think they are what you know ends up convincing Rose, which we'll see in a little bit. Yeah, and and probably even Blake, because uh, the first thing, the first time Blake starts to fight back is after Green Eyes says the thing about what what price are they going to pay to Blake? Yeah, you see him take a mental stand there. Yeah, and and as you touched on before, like even Blake can't come up with a good thing that they could pay him. Like, like <laughs> yeah. Green Eyes, Green Eyes says this, and Blake's like, yeah. Yeah, what are you guys giving me? And they're all sort of like, well, what do you want? Yeah, there's nothing. Like, they have no... That It's an impossible question because Rose has already said she's going to take care of his unfinished business and he's already accepted that he's going to die. And this is just a worse version of that. Like, there's nothing that they can give him that isn't all kind of already wrapped up in a bit of a neat bow. Like, they can say, oh, we'll take care of Evan or something, but that was already going to happen. Like, Yeah, like, I think, you know, and... I get why Blake feels this way. I get why, like, they don't, like, it's just, it's just a no-win situation again. Um, but it's funny, like, I think something this chapter did really well for me was kind of have me yo-yo with the argument. Mm. And uh, obviously something that, like, does, well, yeah, an example of that is right here where we have um, Blake kind of, you know, say, oh, you, you've got to pay me. And they're all like, oh, we can't think of anything. So Blake's like, well, you're going to have to. And then Ty's just like, well, yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And it, like, it just, that's like, rough. I, I, I sort of went straight from being on team like Blake deserves something for this to okay, no, Ty has a point. Yeah, it's already come to the point where uh, Blake is already in debt to his friends, <laughs> so there's already something to repay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Rose sides with Blake that this is an unacceptable compromise. Before Ty, as you said, reminds Blake that it's his fault that they're even in this mess. Um, yeah. Oh, I want to start with the Rose thing because, like, I mean, I definitely didn't didn't see that coming. Um, I, I think right at the start of the chapter, I was like, well, if 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 whatever position Blake takes, Rose is going to take the opposite. And, um, I mean, interestingly, what ends up happening is Blake seems unsure and Rose seems very sure, just not in the direction I would have anticipated. Mm. Um. And I, I was just so on board with this. Like, I've already, I think I've already fawned over every time Blake and Rose have started to team up in, in the last arc or so. And this is, this is really the biggest one, it feels like. Like, before they've calmly managed to, to talk together and work things out, this is actually Rose in the moment stepping up and, and under pressure sort of being, being the bigger person. Mm. Um, and it's so good. Yeah, this is a great Rose moment, right? Um, yeah. It's interesting. I'm, I'm, I really like Rose's energy this whole chapter. And, I mean, Rose is one of my favourite characters, honestly, but <laughs> especially this chapter, because she's just so... She's so unwilling to be pushed around, which I absolutely love, and the way this manifests here is, no, you can't have him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's um, she's so anti the abyss getting what it wants that she won't even let it have Blake. Um, no, like, I, I don't, I don't think that's fair. Um, w what I just said, like, I think, I think there's genuine care for Blake here. Yes. Like she mentions the pillar. Um, and, and that makes it even more powerful. I, I'm, I'm worried. Um, because the thought I had after the, the way the chapter ends was, um, she seems to be 
uh, conquering a lot of her anti-Blake instincts. Interesting in choice of words. Yes. Um, so I'm worried, like, we've obviously seen her tap a lot of conquest energy in the drains, which was, like, definitely the right call at the time. Uh, we needed Rose calling the shots. I think we said that when it yeah. happened. Uh, but I'm worried that she's tapping it even more in this conversation. Uh, and, and I'm just worried if, like, I think she was meant to be careful about how much she uh, she was reaching into that well. Mm. And obviously, given the way the chapter ends, I'm I'm a bit nervous about how things are going to go for Rose uh, and her new um, inhabitant uh, <laughs> after this chapter. Yeah, uh, we'll see, I suppose. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the most interesting part of this to me is Ty implies or straight out says that it's Blake's fault that... Well, he, he says that it's Blake's fault that they're all in this mess. I think the implication is... It's your fault that Alexis is dead, Blake. Which is harsh, he, and Ty he, kind of walks it back a bit, but it's strong. Yeah, he, he definitely like implies that, and it's not. I mean, it's not completely without merit. Like yes. I think that's that's sort of the whole point they get here is people people sort of argue how how much blame should really be placed there, but like it's not it's not a zero amount of blame, and and that's sort of Blake's stance, and like I think that's right. Yeah. Um. You're right. Ty and Tiff sort of tend to ease off a little bit later but there there is a fair sense i think from them of we are the reason you're here and like we don't re- resent that but it, we feel that you have a bit of responsibility here i guess is sort of the impression i get of how they feel yeah um and, and this whole segment like it's just where things go from intense to like off off the scale um yeah very well, very tense yeah like just hearing ty and tiff's opinion on all this and like how hard it is for them like it's just it, it, it again it yo-yoed me back to that sort of idea of well i don't know they have a point blake maybe you should just do it <laughs> um there's also a little beat mixed in here where they note that Faisal has disappeared um so that was easy Faisal's gone forever yep at the end sorted <laughs> don't even need a uh, chapter 16 we're done here aren't we <laughs> i mean it's interesting like i was thinking about that and i was like okay so there's there's three situations here, right? Either Faisal is just actually gone, which I doubt. Um, Faisal is is pulling a a, a sneaky, which I, I think I, I like makes sense. Probably that that's probably the most logical interpretation, especially since I'm not convinced that the barber is is gone for good. Um, but I was thinking the other option, like uh, I was thinking about the lawyers uh, later in the chapter. Like we'll we'll talk about them in a bit, but. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if there's anything that could deal with Faisal, like I can just imagine them getting out of the abyss, and uh, and it's Faisal's not there because he's already been taken care of by something more powerful. <laughs> um, oh, that would be rough. Yeah, like I think that'd be a great extension of how much we've built Faisal up as this unbeatable opponent to have him just instantly kind of beaten by something else. Yeah, yeah, that would be rough. We'll see. No comment. <laughs> um. So Ty mentions the thing about Alexis's death, and this causes Blake to uh, experience a vision. The Abyss decides to show Blake Alexis's death and how it happened. Um, and of course, after this, uh, Alexis's ghost is there. <laughs> um, and so the Abyss is kind of upping its offer, not just giving back his sword and his locket, but saying, hey, also, Alexis. Which... Is this upping the offer? Because what you're doing yes. is and you're also condemning Alexis to be here forever um, or an Alexis knockoff from the Abyss because yeah. she's dead. I don't know if the Abyss gets her like that, but um, it, it, yeah, like, I don't know. The more you think on having Alexis here with him, the more I'm like, I don't know if you'd want to do that to Alexis. <laughs> like, oh, like, there's definitely a, there's definitely an argument for that making the offer worse. Um, but I, like, I think for me, this is, this is where I started to feel like no, well, where I started to notice that the abyss was trying too many things and maybe yeah. starting to get a bit desperate, um, like this is where it's really starting to try and push Blake into making this any any way it can. Yeah, I think um, this Alexis thing was a mistake by the abyss. I mean, it yeah, not only does it kind of reveal to Blake a bit of the kind of falsehoods behind this offer, but yeah. also it 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 turns on our stubborn Blake instinct, right? Like Blake doesn't want. Alexis to be here. Blake doesn't want to be confronted with Alexis's death that he is, you know, yeah. responsible for. Like, why would you? I don't know. It's just kind of. It feels like a misstep from the abyss. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and this is where I started to think, oh man, the abyss r- really wants this to happen and is is struggling to make it. Like, and obviously later we see how it just tries to flip the script and have everyone leave him yes. as, in, in a last ditch effort. <laughs> That's the um, best play that it makes, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so so I, I I I like I like this Alexis bit because it's really the moment where you start to think, oh, like I don't think the abyss is in as in control as it wants to be yeah um of this situation but i also really like it because uh, i feel like wildbo has found a really great way to make alexis's death meaningful but not feel o- overly important to the story like you know how like you know in a lot of tv shows if a main character's dying it has to be like a, a huge death yeah like it's a it's, three episode arc <laughs> yeah exactly like um you know you can't just have them die off off in the corner like a red shirt um, because they're a main character we're more attached to them and i kind of like how it, like this story kind of gets to have it have its cake and eat it too here because alexis did just die off screen yeah last chapter um in in a very unceremonious way and we still got the impact of that on how it was affecting blake but then now also we get to see this vision of it happening sort of after in, in a later moment and and in a way that's very focused on blake who yeah. this death matters to like it's not that this death matters to the world because like i mean this sucks but it, it doesn't like the yeah. abyss doesn't Sorry, care alexis. that alexis is dead <laughs> the, the abyss doesn't care that alexis is dead it wouldn't care if, if half of these people were dead um but blake does and this matters to blake and this is a uniquely personal way of letting us see the death in a way that matters to the story and to us but fits in world really well yeah it takes seeing the death and turns it from a thing that we need to do because it's a book and that's how they work into seeing the death the action of seeing the death itself is very plot relevant, which yes, is, is yeah. very packed. You're right. Like that that's the perfect way of describing it. It's it's really cool. Um while but, we're right, not cool cool's not the right <laughs> word because she died she died. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a pretty brutal death too. She like drops yeah. down a level to escape others and falls and falls too far and just dies. Like seemingly dies on impact with the ground. Um Yeah, and her limbs are all bit yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's a full on death. Um I, I wanna Take a line from a little bit further ahead, because I think it's relevant to this thing that we're talking about, where Blake kind of notices more and more things among the trees, and one that he calls out is, he's hearing bird songs, but they're out of sight, they're not in this clearing, and he has the thought that he would be a bird watcher, but have the birds forever be out of sight, which uh, he doesn't uh, finish the thought, but obviously it's it's a bit of a... Um, of a torture right it's kind of an intentional torture not having the things that he wants be dangled in front of him but never quite be right um yeah this is this is where he really starts to comprehend how much this is not going to be a cushy gig yeah um which which again what was up with inkling dude's life that this was what he was after um because yeah basically it's a perfect torture chamber and the only time you get let out is to is to fight really powerful other things. Like it's it's a it's a shit gig. Yeah, not which a good is deal. On brand for the abyss. Yeah. Um yeah, and I guess this really reaffirms it seems that Blake is really kind of solidifying in his stance now that nah, he's not gonna take this. Yeah, yeah. Um Rose also kind of more firmly establishes that she's on Blake's side. Um, they're not going to give him up, and instead she proposes a deal to the Abyss. Uh, yeah. So, uh, is it just me, or was Rose giving off big Blake vibes? No, yeah, yeah. totally. Um, her, her <laughs> okay. kind of chaotic energy is very Blake, this chapter, right? Well, I mean, not just the, fuck it, we'll find a third path, and I'm going to make a deal with the Abyss aspects, but um, obviously she's about to do the the most Blake mad lad play um, of all time yeah in a minute um like there's there's something and you know they're cut from the same cloth she is the same person so it's it's not ridiculous but like she just she really you know blaked the hell up this chapter and i was i was right here for it (laughs) yeah um i want to take a break from the plot discussion to to give another hand to alistair who is consistently one of the funniest (laughs) and best characters um he kind of almost puts his foot in his mouth in this conversation where um rose basically says i hope you're about not about to suggest that uh, a vestige isn't a person and he's kind of like oh whoops sorry wife (laughs) (laughs) it's it's great i love it yeah it's it's a really good comedy moment like rose asking what's such a blatantly loaded question and else just being like okay okay yep yep <laughs> um it, it, it's hilarious uh i i love how you know in alistair's interlude in 12.x 
I was so convinced he was set up as this ultimate Bahame bad guy. <laughs> and somehow, through the absolute shitstorm that has been the last arc, he's now turned into pretty cool guy. Mm. <laughs> like, especially when he got engaged to Rose. You're just sort of like, well, this is a bad guy. And um, like, I just love how that, that expectation I had has been completely subverted. And I'm now weirdly pro Alistair. He's great. Um, he's awesome. I love him yeah. so much. <laughs> Maybe maybe when things calm down, I'll remember that he's actually just kind of an arrogant dickhead. Yeah. Uh, but in these sorts of situations, he's actually been handy. Like he's been a good guy. He sacrificed that arm that comes up again in this chapter. Mm. Like he's been he's been a cool dude throughout this whole mess. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's talk about Rose's offer, which is that she basically offers a lifetime of service, as she puts it. She will become a scourge, working with you know, if not for the abyss, uh, in exchange for. It letting Blake go. Um, pretty good offer, I think. And and it's funny that she sees it as not being that different from just being a diabolist, like being a kind of practitioner that everyone just hates anyway. Yeah, well, I, I think they hate scourges a lot less than diabolists. You know, like even the um, even the Duchamps were willing to marry one of their daughters off to a scourge, whereas um, I, I doubt there are any diabolists on the uh, on the Duchamp roster. Mm. So. It, I, like I see a scourge socially as being an upgrade from Diablo. Um, my concern here is that uh, she she still goes through with this deal at the end of the chapter, right? So the well, we don't stands. see whether the deal is accepted or not. That that's fair. I'm I'm assuming it is. Um, I could be wrong about that, but like, if it was, and she's now promised to be a scourge her whole life, um, I don't know how the lawyers are going to feel about that. Like I mentioned, that the lawyers were going to come back in later. Mm. Like this is. This is what made me think of them. Like Rose promised to be a scourge, and at first I was like, "Well, isn't she kind of one already?" And then I was like, "Why isn't Why isn't she just one?" And it's like because the lawyers probably wouldn't let her be. So I'd be very interested to see the next time the lawyers rock up how they feel about Rose having promised not to uh, be a diabolist anymore. I'm sure they'll be cool with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they'll understand. <laughs> Um, yes, so, uh, what happens next is, um, pretty interesting. <laughs> Rose asks Alistair if he knows the familiar ritual, and of course, for a few chapters, uh, for a few sentences, we're like, hold on, hold on, no, is this gonna no, happen? No, 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 no. But no, 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 she clarifies <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Something else, uh, not as, uh, terrible, I guess, it is, but still a bit of a terrible idea. Um, she... I'd say it's like 90% <laughs> as crazy an idea as that. Yeah. Um, she, uh, she rips out Blake's heart, I guess, <laughs> and then invites him to possess her. Uh, like, I, I, I love this. I love this so much. Um, I love how she, she's done the same thing as Max. She has taken like a powerfully significant ritual and, and kind of twisted it into a more specific situation. And I just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like symbolically, this is so incredible. Like the idea of Rose literally taking Blake into her to, to heal both of them and, and to help her. Like I, I just, yeah, you know, these Rose Thorburns and their obsession with possession is is finally paying <laughs> off. <laughs> their possession obsession. Yeah, this is such a wild play. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like as we sort of talked about, she feels big Blake here, which um. Uh, you know, as I'm talking about her, you know, using all this conquest energy to conquer her natural instincts, um, uh, you know, there's obviously the fun idea that if they're opposites, her conquering all her natural instincts turns her into a Blake. What Blake needs to mm. do is access that conquest, tap himself, and then they can just, you know, be the appropriate version of themselves for any situation. Well, Blake might be um, able to access it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's, he's right near the source. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, like, obviously, I don't think it's that simple. Like, you know, they're the same person all that. Yes. But it's just, I, I love, I, I, I just love this move from Rose. Like, it's all, all the stuff we, we bitched about re, with regards to her in, like, arcs 10 and 11 when she, she seemed to be the enemy of Blake has just completely disappeared from my head. Like, I'm so on board with her right now. Mm. Yeah. Um, again, Alistair appreciation moment. Uh, Alistair says, damnation. Should have known what I was getting into marrying a Thorburn, which is such a good <laughs> response. And I love that Alistair says damnation instead of just saying damn, because of course he would as a fucking babe. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, yeah, I wish we'd been keeping a tally of Thorburn allies cursing the Thorburn family, because I think it'd be pretty high, like Tiff, Tiff did it a, a couple of chapters ago. <laughs> um it seems to be a phase every thorburn ally goes through yeah yeah it's um, pretty al good although 
something we kind of skipped over. There's a bit where when Rose first starts doing this, uh, no, actually, it's when she first starts cutting the deal with the Abyss, and she's like, "Hey, um, you know, I give you access to my future if mm. I'm lying here." And Alice is kind of like, "I don't know if I like this," and and she kind of shuts him down. But I was like, "It's a fair concern, yeah, isn't it?" Like he he is her future now. They're betrothed. He's he, like a, a lifetime with him is part of what she's offering to the Abyss, like. Yep. That's not very fair for him. Yeah. Um, I can see why he's a little bit concerned. <laughs> Rose is not great at playing with others, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, Blake inhabits Rose and has some visions of inside their soul where there are uh, two sets of memories of getting ready for church, slightly different. Uh, Rose asks the Abyss if they're going to consider her previous offer or <laughs> keep both of them here forever, which I guess is the other option on the table. Um, um, the way, it's just again, the way she phrased it just reminded me of Blake, the way she was just so, and you know, I guess he's inside her now, so it's like, of course, maybe he actually is having an influence, but the bit where she's like, you could break us, it might even be easy. <laughs> uh, and I was just sort of like, oh, th- that's such a Blake thing to yeah. say, where it's not, it doesn't seem helpful. Yes. <laughs> like, it's an unhelpful detail, Rose. Yeah. Um, and uh, the chapter ends with Conquest chuckling. <laughs> it's such a good ending. Um, especially because this is such a triumphant moment, and I was almost going to walk out of the middle of an arc feeling like everything was perfect now yep. um so of course like that had to be taken away and this is such a fun way that it, again it's one of those things where i hadn't even considered that you know this this place already had an occupant yeah it's occupied um, and, uh, yeah th- like this is going to be very fun um yeah s- stepping back a bit i want to talk about like the the stuff blake sees inside rose um like obviously First of all, the story takes a little moment to mention how small Blake is. Like, he's really just this speck of a spirit. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing, um, because hopefully that means the Abyss parts have been left in that body and we're back to, to Blake. Um, I, have, I have my fingers crossed that this is finally the way we get Blake back. Well, how um, much of Blake is there left? You know? Yeah, there's not there's not much, but we got it away from all the bad stuff, um, hopefully. Um, but also, obviously, as you mentioned, there's this really cool imagery of the memories they have and how they're sort of fragmented and broken um in fact blake actually has a moment where he starts to reach out to them wondering if he can just rearrange things a bit and then uh thinks better of it which is like good but also i I don't like the idea that that's possible because that's (laughs) like that's a potential clusterfuck waiting to happen yes Uh, or, or potentially not like um i don't know like we saw that like the pillar right something that demons have destroyed can't be repaired so mm. the the pillar in the library fell fell apart obviously yeah but it doesn't have to stay in pieces like we saw that with a bunch of you know godly power and some vines you can kind of hold it in in roughly the same shape yeah, like it's ne- can... it's never going to be the same strong pillar and it's going to require yeah. a lot more upkeep but uh you can make something that in general resembles the, the original pillar you can't restore it but you can repair it you know yeah and, and like blake and evan are a great example of that their familiar bond was seemingly cut but they've formed a new bond that's strong in its own way like yeah. you you can't recreate exactly what was there but you can rebuild something that you know is maybe close enough and obviously with blake inhabiting rose now i feel like there's going to be really interesting stuff to explore there yeah if they get time to do it which they probably won't because (laughs) there's so much shit still in the air yes um we'll have to see how how that exploration goes next chapter because that's the end of this chapter um what a great chapter it is as well right it it feels like a convergence of so many things and of course it's so good to have conquest back (laughs) yeah like it's hard because because it's been like a week and a half since I read any chapters, which doesn't sound like a lot as I'm saying it, but um, you know, with the schedule we've been on, it was like such a huge gap. And I read this and I was like, had I just forgotten how great this story is? Or was this a particularly strong chapter? <laughs> this might be my favorite chapter so far. Yeah, it's a good um, one, isn't it? Like, you know, given recency bias, probably. But like, this was so good. Mm. Um, as you said, it really feels like so much of the story is starting to come together here yeah yeah definitely um we'll have to see how uh how it continues next chapter uh but before we wrap up our episode it's time to revisit our discussion question which we've been running for the past week uh which yeah. is talking about places that exist in the real world and what they would look like if they were uh subsumed into the abyss i suppose yeah yeah and we got some really fun answers um yeah it really struck home for me how 
easy it is to take things that we think of as mundane and everyday and really turn them into nightmare scenarios. That's really <laughs> like it's it doesn't take that many steps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The abyss is only a couple of steps away. Yeah. Um, I think uh, an answer that sums that up pr- pretty perfectly is bisexual punch parties uh, who talks about Ch- Chicago and how horrible the winters are there and describes what the winters there are like. And I... I I genuinely didn't realize they were describing what the abyss version of Chicago would be until the end because it just <laughs> sounded so like a lived horrible winter experience. <laughs> like, yeah, of course yeah, your right. hands freeze to your door and, and shit like that. Of course that would happen. Yeah, I, I think it was it was something about the way they phrased the start of their thing. I thought they were still talking about the real the problems of real yes. Chicago. And it basically wasn't until I got to the end of the post that I realized this is the exaggerated worse abyssal version <laughs> of Chicago. And um and I, like I I think that's why I really like this answer because this is an this is a version of the abyss where it's not you know like obviously the library was a huge level of interpretation of of Hillsglade House this mm. is whereas this is taking a place and just just making it worse just making it that much harder to be in and like I really like that idea yeah. for a, a different type of abyss yeah definitely I thought it was really cool dial up the cold dial up the loneliness and boom it's it's the abyss <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, I, I also liked David L. Hunt's answer, mm. uh, where they, they talked about sort of, uh, like old churches and, and obviously I think there's so much, there's, there's so much symbolism wrapped up in churches yes. that like, I, I agree this would be a, a gold mine for the abyss. Um, like the, the whole idea of judgment, uh, is something David brings up, mm. um, you know the the way that it could punish you for acting like sinfully yeah that's so uh, cool because uh, yeah. in the library we've had this idea of you know talking is against the rules of the library and you get punished for yes. it and it's such a cool vibe but i would love the idea of some actual morality imposed on that like if you do things that are amoral in air quotes depending on whatever the abyss kind of deems that to be you get punished in a similar way and so you have to live this like abyssal pious life how fucking weird would that be it would be awesome i guess like obviously a lot of this would depend on your exact like flavor of christianity but um like for me i could see one that was very focused on temptation and tempting you with stuff and then punishing you for giving (laughs) in to those temptations yeah Um, Or even kind of trials, like more explicit trials than the Abyss already does, um, where you you have to kind of, you're put in situations of, you know, whatever whatever biblical metaphor you want it to be. You got to walk into the cave of lions and emerge unscathed, you know. Yeah, Um, yeah, I like that. All kinds of just weird trials that I think would be so fun. Um, Another one that I really liked was uh, Sahibamum, who talks about... Uh, a place called the Kingdom Center in Saudi Arabia, which is a big skyscraper mall. Um, And they kind of adapted this out into a a kind of cityscape abyss uh, where you're uh, uh, similar to the tenements, but you're on a kind of network of roofs. So crossing across a number of roofs with like very thin light bridges in between them. Um, And of course, if you descend down into the buildings, you find all manner of horrors. Uh, But they also talked about the idea of a mall and the idea of like barter and shopping being kind of integral to the abyss where you're kind of making these um, needful things-esque bargains uh, or or kind of the gift of the Magi style bargains in order to acquire things that ultimately you find are, you know, useless because of the thing you've had to give up to get them. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, it was also this one, right, uh, Sahabamum 7's answer that talked about how it was a bit of a landmark mm. in the area as well. So the uh, the idea that if it fell down, it would pull the surrounding areas with it just because so much of the surrounding area is defined by the presence of this building. Which yes. Is an idea I really liked and obviously plays into what we've kind of seen happening in Jacob's Bell, uh, the idea that you know places like mara's forest are getting uh, supposedly going to get dragged down with it yes places that aren't able to connect themselves to things outside of the abyss kind of in- inevitably come with it if they're connected to the thing that gets subsumed yeah yeah um <sighs> i guess one more that i want to pull out is uh stuck in reddit factory who just kind of again this really reaffirms to me how similar a lot of places just are to the abyss already they just talk about some of the things that are happening in australia at the moment uh so if you haven't heard (laughs) there's this huge wildfires in australia at the moment um which obviously would lend to a not cold and lonely version of the abyss but like frantic and hot 
uh, which I guess is closer to the library than the drains. Um, but then also, you know, there's shout outs to things like uh, coal and mining ruining the landscape and, and leading to all kinds of horrifying things. And yeah, Australia is basically the abyss at the moment. So that's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that the bit that really stuck out to me from this answer was um, the the idea of this this you know fiery uh hellish abyss Mm. um sort of constantly burning you like like, you know the abyss is all about change right and and morphing you into something else and stuck in reddit factory talked about how like just burning you to ashes and forcing you to constantly rebirth yourself like a phoenix kind of thing from the ashes in a completely new form um it, it could be this sort of rapid fire version of the abyss like a really like this is like the hard level of the abyss, the 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 bushfire version, where yeah. you're constantly being very quickly torn apart, and you have to reform in in these sorts of very temporary ways, and, and you know, like it's just it just felt like this very extreme version of the abyss. I thought it was a really cool idea. Yeah, interesting. I really like that. Yeah, there's a lot of there were a lot of really cool answers. I think we we haven't done a lot of justice to them on the show because a lot of them are just people taking places that are important to them and drawing out the cool features of them. So I definitely recommend you go back through our past three discussion threads and and take a look at them. Yeah, yeah, we didn't manage to pull everyone's out unfortunately, but um, they're like there are lots of cool ideas that that we missed basically. So it's yeah. definitely worth checking them out. Yeah, for sure. Um, one one last thing before we move on to next week's discussion question. Um, someone put did put in a thread that wasn't discussion question related, but I just wanted to talk about it because it was a really cool uh, little thought. Uh, and this comes from uh, Bigo Miko. Yep, sure. Uh, yep. Um, just sort of was thinking about what Barbatorum's symbol made because, like, obviously he's kind of defined by his shears at the moment. Mm. but like shears are a human invention presumably like what what sort of symbolism would there have been for for cutting before humans invented stuff like knives and blades mm. um and, and so uh you know michael sort of tied this back to um like adam and eve and how eve in, in you know that creation myth was supposedly cut from adam mm. and just how that does sound a little bit like what's happened here yeah uh, to, to blake right. and rose like it's just it was just a neat little connection and and they sort of tied it to this this theory that you know demons have always been important for shaping reality um because there's so many spots that they fit into the idea of like the christian uh or no the abrahamic um creation myth uh it, it's just yeah, I don't know. Like, I I don't know if I want to read too much into it or anything, but it does feel like a little cool connection of how easily the demons slot into this this very ancient myth, and and how that sort of supports the idea that demons were always an important part of shaping the universe. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. I've I've I'd never noticed the parallel of Adam and Eve and Blake and Rose before, but it it is quite strong. Yeah, there's there's definitely something to be done there. Mm. Um, and uh, or who had. It was it was their great grandmother who had the snake familiar, right? <laughs> Close. That's nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks everyone for leaving your discussion uh, answers and your comments and all that stuff. Um, we have a new discussion question, which is now that Johannes is dead, we can finally answer the question of was his domain a good idea? <laughs> like, was it fine? <laughs> now that we know, yeah. it wasn't uh insidious there wasn't any ulterior motive let's talk about this is this fine is what he was doing okay um we've actually for some reason we've had this discussion question sitting at the top of our list since arc eight i believe and we just kept coming up with other things to inject in and i have a feeling it was you putting it off ruben until we got the reveal that johannes actually did mean for it to be good yeah i yeah (laughs) i think it's it's important for us to know that yes it had good intentions and there was a way that he saw it succeeding but it was corrupted by an angel right um yeah and i think that's i think that's an interesting angle and something that we can talk about the way that it ended up being was it fine was there a better way for it to go was you know like yeah yeah i i I really i'm also interested to explore the the whole moral side of taking bits of unknowing innocence and, and feeding them to others as a kind of uh tax on everyone um for to to feed this this evil or this underbelly of society um in the others yeah um like there's a lot to do here and yeah i'm i'm excited that we're finally getting to do it um because i think 
I'm, ex- I'm still expecting the barber to come back. I don't. I'm not expecting Johannes to. Mm. Uh, so I think I think we can safely safely assume he's he's dead and his domain is probably disintegrating right now. Mm. Um, so I think yeah, you're right. This is this is our probably our last opportunity to finally have this discussion, and I'm keen to hear everyone's thoughts. Yeah. Um, so take those thoughts, put them in a, a Reddit post, and leave that Reddit post in our discussion threads, which will be linked down in the show notes down below. Yep. Um, and if, if you want to hear more about what's going on at Doof, uh, including, of course, learning more about Kingslingers, yeah. that, that cool new show that, that we've already talked about, yep. head on over to doofmedia.com and it's all there. Yeah, I've never read uh, any of the Dark Tower books, but I'm pretty sure that they have to do with spooky things and like skeletons <laughs> and shit. And uh, Matthew McConaughey and Idris Elba, they're there as well. So yep. if you want all that goodness, uh, go and check out Kingslingers. I think we might get in trouble for mentioning that movie. I don't, oh. I don't, know, if, I don't know if that was a, a popular one. And that's um, literally the only thing I know about The Dark Tower. So I'm excited. I bought uh, <laughs> the the first one. I don't know what it's called. I think it's just called The Dark Tower, is it? No, it's The Gunslinger. Oh, yes, I The think. Gunslinger. Um, I, I bought that. It's on. It's, it's being slung by Amazon towards me now. So <laughs> I'm excited to, to dive into that as Kingslingers kicks off. Um, yes, and if you want to support shows like Deep Impact shows like Kingslingers, yep. um, and and you know you can even go there and see what else might be coming up if we get more patrons. Yeah, um, there we've just sort of had our first uh, doof uh, planning meeting. Yes, for the year, uh, and there's a lot of cool stuff cooking for 2020. Yeah, I'm there'll probably be some new patron uh, rewards coming up soon. So if you want to contribute to making more cool, cool content at Doof, the place to go is Patreon.com/slash/DoofMedia. Yeah. Um, so to give you an example, uh, for just joining us at the one dollar tier, as well as cool things like the Discord and mm-hmm. and stuff, you also get to vote in all the various contests. Yes. Uh, so obviously we know about all the Parahumans contests and everything, but uh, coming up next week uh, is the deadline for the Do the Right Thing contest. It's, um, I believe it's called Doof the Right Thing. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so. Th- there's basically going to be a bunch of cool stories posted uh, as a result of that contest, and uh, the patrons are the ones who get to vote on which one is the coolest. And so it's definitely worth you know checking out, joining the community. There's a lot of great fun in there, and you know you get to sort of have your say on which story or art or whatever you think is the bestest. Yeah. Um, if you have thoughts about what you think it would be funny to see two uh, tired and maybe drunk Australians do on a live stream, there's a link <laughs> in our description for this show to leave us thoughts on what you'd like to see for All Packed Up, our 24-hour live stream that we're doing on March 7th uh, to wrap up this show. So uh, leave some thoughts there. Um, and also, yeah. while you're leaving things, why don't you leave some support for, for Wildbow and his Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Wildbow? Because he writes all these cool stories. So give him some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that, sim- it's that simple, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so apart from that, we're going to see you all again on Friday, the 17th of January for Possession 15.5. Yep. See you then. I phrased that very definitively. I'm, I'm going to be forsworn if anyone doesn't yeah. listen to this next episode. So please, all of you do. <laughs> yeah. If you listen to this one, you have to listen to the next one or I'm fine. <laughs> or else Elliot's dead. <laughs> anyway, see ya. See ya. <laughs>